I've heard people say that mindsets are the secret to success, but I'm not sure that's a secret because I think most people understand that mindsets are really important. Now, I think that the secret around mindsets is less about how important they are and more about what mindsets do we need to have. Hey everybody, welcome to Live Your Legacy. My name is Darius and the goal of our podcast is to help you live your own legacy by connecting you to people and concepts that have made a tremendous impact on the lives of others. Today's legacy guest is a mindset coach and cutting-edge leadership consultant, trainer and researcher. He is also a Wall Street Journal and USA Today best-selling author of the book Success Mindsets. He holds a PhD in organizational behavior and human resources from Indiana University. And is recognized as one of the best professors at Mihilo College of Business and Economics. For the past years, he has worked with dozens of organizations to identify and shape their current mindsets to mindsets that fuel better decision-making, growth, and performance. As a respected authority and research on organizational behavior and mindset, he has published seven journal articles and his research has been cited over 2,000 times since 2014 while having a dissertation highlighted as a best paper. Let's welcome our guest today, the whole mindset expert of success mindsets, Ryan Godfrayson. Hello, thanks for having me on. Okay, great. Let's jump right into the first question. <laughs> really excited about this whole um, interview because I'm all about mindsets and I believe that mindsets are so much greater than just looking at behaviors because mindset is what triggers behaviors and feelings as well. So just want to jump on to the first question of share with us what got you passionate about, passionate about this whole thing called mindset. Yeah, and, and I love your excitement and your enthusiasm towards the topic because I, I feel the same way. And there was a time in my life where I didn't even know what mindsets were. But what I've come to learn about mindsets is that they're foundational to everything that we do. And so for, but for most of us, our mindsets are something that we're not conscious of. But when we become conscious of them, it's like, holy cow, these mindsets are driving how I think, how I learn, and how I behave. And, and so it's a really foundational element about ourselves. And when we get to know our mindsets, we get to know ourselves at a really deep level. So I I love the enthusiasm. How I stumbled across mindsets was when I was at Indiana University and doing my dissertation on leadership, what I learned is the last 70 years of leadership research has primarily focused on leadership behaviors. What do leaders need to do to be effective? And I think that that's a good thing to understand. It's really helpful. It seems like a lot of people want to know this, but it seems a little bit short-sighted to me because I think that leadership is more than just doing the right thing. It's about being a certain type of individual, a certain type of person that others want to follow. And so for the last seven years, the focus of my research has been focusing on how do we tap into this being element of leadership? And everything's led me to mindsets because of what I mentioned earlier is our mindsets are foundational to our being, how we think, how we learn, and how we behave. And so if we can help people awaken to and improve their mindsets, we'll be literally improving their being. And so how did you actually got into this whole fascination of success mindsets? I mean, were you previous, do you previously have this form of success mindset or how was it like? No. So uh, as I started to come across research on mindsets and seeing really interesting studies about how, let's just say a three minute video, watching a three minute video about how stress is good for you, improves your engagement, your performance and your blood pressure. Right? So uh, I'm thinking, wow, like, one small little intervention changes your mindsets and that changes how you operate. So, so when I came across studies like this, the question that I had was, if mindsets are so powerful, what mindsets do I need to have? And the first thing that I did, and, and I just think it's fun to laugh at now, is literally the first thing I did is I went to Google and I typed in in the Google search bar, what mindsets do I need to have to be successful? And uh, of course, I you know, like millions I, I of hits. That before as well. <laughs> yeah, so millions of hits pop up. And for me, 
uh, I would say that 99.5% of all of the articles that popped up didn't even focus on mindsets. They focused on behaviors. And I think this is, this is just the, the majority of material out there on mindsets, in my opinion. I think it's very well intended, but to me, it's really fluffy and not very tangible. Um, so I, I still think it can be helpful, but if we can make it a little bit more concrete, then it's gonna be better for us. And so what I did from there is I then opened up the floodgates in the academic literature to identify where are mindsets being studied and what mindsets are out there. So and let's so, really dive into, before you move on, I think gonna start yeah. uh, differentiating the different mindsets. What is the definition of mindset to you? Yeah, so at a high level, our mindsets are the mental lenses that we wear that shape how we view the world. But at a deeper level, is what they really are is their neural connections in our prefrontal cortex that plays three specific roles. So, so when we encounter a new situation or really any situation, our senses are sending an incredible amount of information to our prefrontal cortex, the executive center of our brain. It's way more information than we can process. And so our brain relies upon our our mindset neural connections initially to, to filter in specific information out of all of this information that's being sent. So the first job is we're filtering in specific information. The second job is we interpret that information in unique ways. So this is uh, why two people could see the same thing such as failing but one person interpret failing as a bad thing, another interpret person interpret failure as a good thing and something to learn from. So that, that's the second job is interpret this information in a unique way. And then the third job is to activate the different elements about ourselves, like our personality, our strengths, our talents, our values, to best navigate how we interpreted that situation. And so those are the three jobs. So filtering in specific information, then interpreting that information in unique ways and activating the different elements about ourselves uh, to, to navigate our world in the way that our mindsets deem most effective. And so this is the reason, again, why two people can encounter the same situation, but interpret it and operate, you know, based upon that interpretation so different. And you, I realize you use the word interpretation a lot in your book, Success Mindset. So how do we know what's the best interpretation to adopt in a situation? Like what you say, there are always conflicting uh, interpretation and this usually leads to conflict. So how do we know like what's the best interpretation well, it, to adopt in a situation? Yeah, and it's so tricky because the way that we interpret the world is we naturally are going to think this is the best way to interpret the world. Because... If we thought we could interpret the world in a better way, we would have done so already. And so we're kind of all walking around with our own unique mindsets and we feel like at a subconscious level at least that our mindsets are the best ways to view the world. But the reality is, is that not likely the case? And that's what I've learned from my experience. It's what's learned from, uh, I have a personal mindset assessment that I've had 10,000 people take and only 5% of these people are in the top quartile of the four different sets that I focus on. So most of us have some mindset work to do. But if we, if we can step outside of ourselves and evaluate these lenses that we look through, we can empower ourselves to change those lenses and improve them. And fortunate for us is we've got 30 plus years of academic research that is identified four specific mindsets that we need to have if we want to be more, more successful. Okay, so now you're talking about the four different mindsets. I, let me quote you from the book, which is basically fit, fix to growth, close to open, prevention to promotion, and inwards to outwards. So do explain how this four different uh, category works and how they play a part in our lives. Yeah, great question. And let me just kind of say that these four sets of mindsets they're not anything I've created. It's just 
there's, these are the ones that have been researched over the last 30 years. They're not the only mindsets that we can investigate, but they are the ones with the most research backing. And as you mentioned, there's, there's kind of, there's poles on a continuum. There's fixed on one side and growth on the other side. And our mindset that we currently have is going to fall somewhere along that continuum. And so for each of these sets of mindsets, our mindsets kind of may be more on the negative side or they may be more on more of the positive side. And what is really important is coming to an understanding of what is the current quality of our mindsets along these continuums. Because what that does is it identifies our starting place in terms of the quality of our mindsets, but also helps us identify where we need to make some shifts in order to see the world in a better way and therefore navigate it in a better way. So okay. uh, do you want to go into each of these different Yeah, mindsets? I was about to ask you. I think it would be lovely if you dive into each of this category. Great. So maybe let's take them one by one, if that's okay. And, yes, and then we can, it, And then we can uh, dive as deep as you want onto any of these. So the first set that I focus on is the difference between a fixed mindset and a growth mindset. And when we have a fixed mindset, we don't believe that we could change our talents, abilities, and intelligence. Another way of saying this is we have a tendency to believe that the world is full of haves and have nots. So you either have it or you don't. You either have the skills and abilities or you don't. Somebody with a growth mindset, they do believe that they could change their talents, abilities, and intelligence. And they don't see the world in terms of haves or have nots. You see, they see that if you are a have not right now, that wouldn't preclude you from being a have later. So if you're a podcaster with a growth mindset and you're just starting out, you may be a have not at the moment, but that doesn't mean that you can't be a great podcaster in the future. Somebody with a fixed mindset would say, if, if you do your first podcast and you totally vomit, well, uh, that's, that's just the way I am. This isn't going to work out. I better, I better not do a podcast. Maybe I'll do a blog instead, right? So that's the example of how uh, a fixed mindset versus a growth mindset plays out. Ultimately, those with a fixed mindset are afraid of failure because if they fail, they're left to interpret and they can't change. So if they fail and they can't change, they're left to interpret that as though they are a failure. And so those with a fixed mindset, their primary focus is on looking good, whereas those with a growth mindset, their primary focus is on learning and growing. And, and that'll shape how they operate. I really love the point where you're saying um, the difference is actually based on looking good versus learning and growing. Right? So how do we become aware of like whatever negative filter that we're having right now? Well, it's, it's tough. So to me, there's two things that can occur um, that are really helpful. So one is, and this is why I developed my personal mindset assessment to really help make it easy on people. So, and that's on my website at ryangotfordson.com. It's free. It's 20 questions, takes about five minutes, but you get a really comprehensive report on the quality of your mindsets and how your mindset stacks up to the 10,000 other people who have taken the assessment. So that's one way to kind of identify where we are currently. But if we don't take the assessment, really the only way to gauge where we're at in terms of the quality of our mindset is to really dive deep and understand the differences between these mindsets and how they cause people to think, learn, and behave differently. Because if we don't have one, a label for these things, and if we don't have an understanding of them, we'll never be able to introspect about that. But the tricky thing about it is when we do it, do this introspection without an assessment, we have a tendency to be a little bit biased towards ourselves. Um, and we generally think that we have a more positive mindset than maybe we really do. Um, and so that's something that generally plays out. And that's why I love having the mindset assessment there is it provides uh, some pretty objective information about the quality of your mindsets. Okay, great. Let's dive into the second one where it's based on close to open. So do elaborate more about that. Yeah, thank you. So when we have a closed mindset, we're close to the ideas and suggestions of others. When we're open, we're open to others' ideas and suggestions. And to better explain this, I want us to 
compare our mind to a bucket. And we need to ask ourselves, how full is our bucket? You see, when, when we have a closed mindset, we see our bucket as being full. In that what I know is best. And when what we know is best, and it means that we have this full bucket, what happens if we pour something into a full bucket? It'll well, flow over. Flow over. Nothing gets absorbed. It just runs off the sides. And so that's what happens when we have a closed mindset. When we feel like what we know is best, we're not able to take in any new and additional information. And our primary focus with this closed mindset is on being seen as right. So I know what is best, therefore I want to be seen as right. When we have an open mindset, what we're doing is we're just leaving at least a little bit of room in our bucket for the idea that we can be wrong. Because that's just when, so that when people, when something gets poured into it, we're able to capture that. And if we can leave some room in our bucket for the idea that we could be wrong, we're no longer focused on being right. We're focused on finding truth and thinking optimal. So generally what we'll see is closed minded people are the ones that feel like they have all the answers. Open minded people are feeling, they may think that they have a lot of the answers, but they, they also recognize that they don't have all of the answers, but they want all of the answers. And so rather than being the one providing all the answers, they're the ones asking questions. Uh, and, and that's a really powerful space to be in, uh, in terms of uh, our own learning and growth, but also creating an environment that other people want to work within. So I think psychologically just a safe question on the closed mindset part. I think a lot of us, once we reach a certain level of maybe a practice or mastery, Right, then we realize like, oh, I know this already, I know that. So when someone teaches us something new, then it's naturally like that defense will come out in the sense that I think what, ans what answer that I have right now should be the right answer. Is there like a research or like a, a stat where basically it shows like how much biasness we have towards our own answers in life? Well, yeah, I mean, we're, we're always going to be more biased towards ourselves. I think out of the four sets of mindsets, this is the one that we have the hardest struggle introspecting about. Uh, because I think even the closed-minded think that they're open-minded. And, and what we've got to realize, and, and this is really helpful for me, and, and I think it's helpful for a lot of experts, because experts can come across as being closed-minded a lot of the time because how full their bucket is. I mean, they, they may have a really full bucket. So the key for me is, is we've got to recognize that we can always take a stand. We can have a stiff back. But the key to being open-minded is even if we have a stiff back, we also need to have a soft front. So we just need to be able to take in the ideas and suggestions of others take them seriously, mull them over. Not that we have to run with them, but we need to at least validate these ideas that are coming in. And so if I'm talking to somebody and I know that they're clearly wrong, rather than quickly shut them down, just ask some questions about it. Oh, what, what led you to this conclusion? Well, oh, did you think about X, Y, and Z, right? So we're not saying, no, that's a dumb idea. We're saying, hmm, what led to this conclusion? And, and the more that we could create that soft front, the more we're going to be able to create a, an environment of psychological safety that brings out the best in everybody. Now, I really love the whole concept of soft front. Then it makes basically our position in the fact that we're susceptible to whatever new ideas that are coming towards our way. So let's move on to the third one, which is prevention to promotion. Do elaborate on that. Yeah, the prevention mindset when we're focused on not losing and the promotion is when we're focused on winning. And, and that may seem like a small difference, but it has huge implications. And so to kind of paint the difference, let me, let's imagine that we're a ship captain in the middle of the ocean. Okay. And if we have a prevention mindset, then our number one focus is on not sinking. So we don't want any problems to occur. We don't want to take any risks. We don't want to rock the boat, right? Because that's that make us feel uncomfortable. Definitely. But what happens when a storm comes on the horizon? If we have a prevention mindset and this storm is coming towards us, how are we naturally going to respond? What do you think? Probably gonna think of all the worst case possible 
possible scenarios and maybe even panic. Panic and run from the storm, right? We're going to move away from it because that storm is risky. That storm might sink us. So let's go to a place of safety. But we got to ask ourselves, is that place of safety the destination we originally set out for? Probably not. We're kind of just being blown about by the winds and the currents of the sea. We're being the passenger in our life. We're letting our environment dictate where we go. When we have a promotion mindset, it's not that we're not concerned about sinking because we are, but our number one concern is on getting towards a destination and making progress towards it. And so when we have a promotion mindset, that storm comes on the horizon, rather than run from it, we anticipate the problems that might occur and we prepare for them. So we batten down the hatches and then we become willing to take the risk of braving the storms. Because we know that that is the only way to get from where we are to the destination that we want. And so that, that to me, this is, that's, it's a small focus where difference of focus, where those with the prevention mindset are primarily focused on ensuring comfort and avoiding problems, where those with the promotion mindset are focused on a purpose and making progress towards it. And, and that difference is going to be so incredibly different because we're, we're going to end up in completely different destinations. And usually the prevention is kind of the path of least resistance, where the promotion is the ones that are hiking up the mountain. They're the ones that get to the top. Definitely. I think this reminds me of the whole concept of like, it's a bit similar to like being in a comfort zone and outside of the comfort zone, because maybe people with prevention mindset usually don't, don't want to take any risks. So they won't be the one that steps out from the comfort zone where basically are the, are, are the, that is the destination that they want to be at, right? So that's, I feel like that is something very similar to the comfort zone and outside of the comfort zone. Um, so to explain more about the last one, which is inward to outward. Yeah, so the difference here is an inwards on the negative side. And when we have an inward mindset, we see ourselves as being more important than others. And when we see ourselves as being more important than others, we have a tendency to see others as objects and, and to treat them as such. When we have an outward mindset, we see others as being just as important as ourselves. And when we see them in this way, we're able to see them as people as opposed to objects. And, and I think that this is one, I, personally, is one that I feel like I struggle with the most. Uh, it's really easy to slip into this inward mindset. So um, I don't know about in Singapore, uh, you know, there's maybe not doing a whole lot of driving. But for example, here in the United States, when you're in a place with a lot of traffic and, and someone wants to merge into your lane, there's some, sometimes you're like, no, I don't want you to come into my lane. Like, this is my spot. And, and what we do in, in that moment is, it, I mean, that's kind of a jerk thing to do, is to not let somebody in. But, but what we do to justify that is we say, instead of, I didn't let that person in, we'll say, I didn't let that car in. We'll, we'll start to see them not as a person of value, but that's as really an obstacle that's getting in our way. So that's hopefully an example of, an, uh, of how an inward mindset. Yeah, I think that is so relevant because when it comes to companies or leading teams, we always focus on like KPIs. We always focus on our eyes, right? And we tend to like, whenever we have people under us and we're like, okay, guys, this is what you're going to hit. And that's all. And we start caring more about the numbers rather than the people itself. I'm not sure if um, that's something that you deal with uh, with a lot of organizations as well. All the time. All the time. And that's that's... You bring up such a huge point because what do most leaders and managers focus on? They focus on what is measured. And what is measured is always going to be what we call a lagging indicator, something around the numbers. Well, if we, what is better to focus on instead of the lagging indicators is the leading indicators, the things that drive the numbers, right? And so when we, when we are focused on the lagging indicators as a leader and a manager and, and things aren't going very well, our natural inclination is going to be to micromanage. 
So I'm going to, I'm going to exert greater control, but the more control that we exert, the less engaged our employees become. And the less engaged our employees are, the less they're going to drive the numbers that we're seeking. And so what is, and so it takes a lot of courage for a leader, a manager, because what they've got to do is they've got to take their eyes off of the prize, what is being measured and evaluated, and look at something that isn't being measured and evaluated. And that's the people. So the more that we can focus on the people, lift them, the more we are going to drive, ultimately drive the numbers that we're seeking. Okay, but it's e about, way easier said than done. Yes, definitely. That's how I'm going to dive in more. And you were talking about leading indicators and number indicators. So let's say um, to all managers out there or to even leaders right, like me, um, what kind of leading indicators should we actually be looking at? Right? Because it's so hard to quantify or to qualify like what exactly is a leading indicator as well. Well, I, I think a global leading indicator that we need to focus on as a leader and manager is employee engagement because employee engagement encompasses the entire employee experience. So employee engagement is an employee's an emotional connection to their job or organization that's characterized by vigor, dedication, and absorption, right? So I, I think we all want employees that are vigorous, dedicated, and absorbed. Definitely. And so what we need to do now, you don't get vigorous, dedicated, and, and absorbed employees by saying, um, you know, here's a, here's a huge paycheck, or if you mess up, you're going to be punished. Like, you can't incentivize this emotional connection. What you've got to do is you've got to create an environment that allows, to that, allows for that vigor, dedication, and absorption to grow. And so if we look at our mindsets that we've focused on, each of these mindsets have different desires associated with them. So on the negative side of things, so fix, close, prevention, and inward, the desires are the desire to look good, be right, avoid problems, and get ahead. And if I'm a manager and these are my desires, that I look good as a manager, I'm right as a manager, I'm not having any problems, and I'm getting ahead, then what's with is they're saying my man is incredibly self-focused and isn't going to bring out the best in me. But if our manager can be growth, open promotion outward, which the desires are a desire to, to learn and grow, a desire to find truth and think optimally, a desire to reach goals and a desire to lift others. I mean, who would you rather work for as an employee? Definitely the somebody who's focused on themselves or somebody who's focused on learning and growing, uh, thinking optimally, reaching goals and lifting others. Like that's such a huge difference. And so what I find is that many managers and leaders, we, we just feel socially pressured to look good, be right, avoid problems and get ahead. So we, we naturally take those desires on but the more that we do that, we're actually handicapping our leadership. And so what we've got to do is we've got to be really intentional about our mindsets and, and shifting our focus away from these desires to the more healthy desires of learning and growing, thinking optimally, reaching goals, and lifting others. Now, I think there's one thing that I want to... Um... One thing that I really want to ask, and it's based on close to open, and I think it might be affected by the rest of the mindsets as well, right? But it's more of the fact that we are usually quite self-protective of ourselves. So when it comes to criticism, when it comes to feedback, sometimes it's, it's not easy. I mean, nobody, nobody would like to get attacked by other people or like, you know, receive really blunt criticism. So how do we transit from, you know, being more of a self-protective uh, person to more of being willing to be criticized and to get feedback? Yeah, great question. And this is a great example. So, and, and when I speak to groups, I'll often ask them, what is your natural reaction to receiving constructive criticism? And 95% of people say that they get defensive, right? That's just kind of, because what's going on in our brain is an emotional hijack is, is occurring. And, and we are, 
we are reacting to the situation because it's this just our natural reaction because it's it usually brings up fears that's going on so it, it's it's this hijack that's going on in our brain but when we start to talk about mindsets as we have what we start to do is we allow ourselves the capability to stand outside of ourselves and investigate these natural reactions and if they're actually serving us well and re reacting defensively to constructive criticism is never going to be healthy in the long run it may be healthy it may feel good in the short run but it's never going to be beneficial in the long run for ourselves or for those around us so it's a reaction that generally isn't going to serve us very well and it's only until we recognize that do we develop the capability of rather than reacting to those situations thoughtfully respond to those situations so we've got what we've got to do though is this is where we've got in our brain we've got a closed mindset neural connection and we have an open mindset neural connection now the one that we rely upon primarily is the one that is stronger because the one that is stronger fires more loudly and more quickly the one that is weaker fires more slowly and more softly and so what we've got to be able to do is we've got to be able to exercise activate and strengthen our positive mindset neural connections so that we come to rely upon those more than our our negative mindset neural connections and so that's how we ultimately how we shift our mindsets is by activating and strengthening our positive mindset neural connections mindfulness is, is is a huge part of this because it allows us the ability to see that we need to make some some shifts but then we've got to engage in some exercises that will activate and strengthen our positive mindset neural connections and, and those could be reading books watching videos engaging in journaling exercises having discussions um, and, and engaging in positive self-talk. And so I could even give you a couple of examples of those, but cool, hate, cool, at a high level, that's, uh, that's kind of how we shift. Do you want me to give you an example? Yes, yes, go ahead, go ahead. <laughs> okay, really so this, this is a personal example. For most of my adult life, I had a prevention mindset. I was more focused on avoiding problems than I was on reaching goals. In fact, I think I became a professor because I had a prevention mindset. As wow. I, I kind of saw becoming a professor as being a safe way to go. Like I would have good work-life balance, I would make a decent amount of money, um, and I, I wouldn't have to take a lot of risk like an entrepreneur would. And I never thought I would be an entrepreneur. Well, one day I, I was meeting with a, a friend of mine who's a CEO and he hands me this book. It's called The Five-Minute Journal. Have you heard of The Five-Minute Journal? I think I heard about it from some people. Okay, so he hands me this book and he says, to change your life. And, and I, I love books. And so initially I'm kind of outwardly, oh, thank you so much. I, I love books. But inside, I, I see the title journal and I'm thinking in my own mind, there is no way in hell I'm journaling. Like this is not going to happen. Journaling is not for me. But I, I brought it home. What I, I opened it up and I find that sure enough, you're, it's just meant to spend five minutes in the journal in the journal every day. And in the morning, it, it asks you to fill out three questions. So the three questions are, what are three things you're grateful for? What are three things that would make today great? And fill in some daily self-affirmations. And so I, I kind of said, oh, I'll give this two weeks. And if I, if I feel like there's an effect, then I'll keep doing it. If not, no harm, no foul. So, so I started doing this and answering that question, how, what are three things that would make today great? That, help, that was my activator of my promotion mindset neural connections. Every morning I was activating that because I was starting to ask myself, how do I make today better than yesterday? How do I make this week better than last week? How do I make this month better than last month? And by doing this just five minutes a day, I, over the course of a few weeks, I shifted from having a prevention mindset to having a promotion mindset. And upon making that shift, I realized that I wasn't heading towards my goals. I was playing it safe. 
And so I, I then went on to start my own business. I took out a loan to do that, which beforehand I, I hated <laughs> debt because it seemed too risky. Uh, I went on, I, I wrote my book, which has now gone on to become a Wall Street Journal and USA Today bestseller. Like, I, I never would have done those things. That, you know, we wouldn't be having this conversation if ultimately I hadn't have shifted from a prevention mindset to a promotion mindset. So hopefully that's a, a good example of uh, a tool that we could use to activate our positive and really shift our mindset. No, that's really interesting. And you're talking about journaling, right? It's a lot more self-reflection. And I think, I think it's Ray Dialo who said that uh, pain and reflection equal to progress, right? So yeah, I think journaling is probably the most effective ways in terms of understanding more about ourselves. And actually, when you look back at it, then you realize like, oh, wow, there's a lot of things I didn't know about myself. So now that you, got, you brought about the term of more self-awareness and journaling, what kind of questions can we ask ourselves to shift more um, within these four mindsets? You talk about prevention to promotion. So how about the other three mindsets? Like what kind of questions can we ask ourselves on a daily basis to make that shift? Yeah, so um, let, me, let me start with, uh, I'll start at the bottom with inward and outward mindsets. So one of the questions that I ask myself now that I know these is I could ask myself, am I being inward or outward? Or I could ask it differently. Am I seeing them as a, person or as an object, right? Immediately upon asking that, it forces me to be more mindful about how I'm seeing the world. Uh, so, so hopefully that's a good example. Uh, one of the things that we've found a, in terms of prevention and promotion, a journal exercise that's really effective at exercising our, po our promotion mindset neural connections is writing about your goals and aspirations. So what, what, there's a really interesting study that's been done where they had one group of people write about their goals and aspirations. They had another group of people write about their duties and obligations, which activates more of the prevention mindset. And then they had a third group of people that did nothing. And then what they did is they would take three, three individuals, one from each of these groups, and put them into a team and have them work on a project. And, and then what they did is they tracked how each of these individual group members participated. And what they found is that those who had written two paragraphs about their goals and aspirations, they were more proactive in the conversation and they were voted as being having a higher reputation than their peers. So just by, you know, if we're, this is just a simple intervention. If we're going into a team meeting, if we take a moment to write down our goals and aspirations, we are going to naturally operate at a higher level team meeting. So that's, that's an example of a, a quick little journaling exercise that we could do for prevention to promotion in addition to uh, the five minute. Uh, when it comes to close to open, one of the things that I, I think is important is we need to, um, we could journal about what are times in which we we're closed-minded, and how did that negatively affect, affect us? And what are times when we were open-minded that we, we shifted how we thought and what were the benefits for that? All right, so I, I'll give you an example of something that I could journal about is I grew up in a location where um, homosexuals were viewed very negatively, right? I, I, and that's kind of just because of my upbringing, that's how I thought of homosexuals. Well, life experience tells me that's not the best way to think about the situation. So I had to shift how I thought about it. Well, what has been the effect of that now that I've been open-minded to seeing a different perspective? Well, now I feel like I'm a much more uh, inclusive individual than I was before, right? So we could journal something along those lines. Uh, if we want to shift from a fixed mindset to a growth mindset, it's really helpful to journal about, and, and this is it, particularly for those who are fi have a fixed mindset, we've got to identify instances in which we, we tried something new and we failed and we learned from it. So if we can identify the instances and journal about the instances where we tried something new failed and became better because of it, 
that's going to activate our, our growth mindset neural connections and help us to see that failure is, isn't a death sentence. It's, it's really actually maybe the most helpful way for us to grow. Now, something that you have mentioned just now was the prevention to promotion. And you were saying how the one, the group that basically wrote the goals and aspirations are the ones that have achieved basically better results. It's been said many times that whatever that um, you keep thinking about, like whatever you imagine about, the mind can't really differentiate between imagination and reality, if I'm not wrong. So I just want to know more about that whole research of like writing that goals and aspirations down and how it really affects us. Yeah, and, and I would say I don't know too much about the research in terms of the dark side of kind of um, having your goals and aspirations like almost become a reality without it necessarily being a reality. Uh, I, I am a believer in the idea that, uh, and I'm a follower of, I don't know if you know who Mike Dooley is. He, he has a, um, if you go to tut.com, which is tut.com, you can for an email uh, subscription where every morning you get an email from him, but it really, he signs it as the universe. So it's called notes from the universe. And I love it. It's the first thing that I look at every morning is a note from the universe. And, and one of the things that he commonly says is thoughts become things. And, and I think at a very basic level, that is, that's the absolute truth is we are never going to be able to create greatness until we think that we can, right? It, it's having this locus of control that is really important. But of course, we don't want to get to the point where maybe we have this narcissism that it has to come to pass, right? Where, and that we are the most important, you know, thing. I think a lot of narcissists have more of the inward mindset, which really affects them. They generally have more of the closed mindset. Um, and so that's why I feel like if we could focus on the four sets of mindsets, we could cr really create a healthy balance for ourselves. Um, and I think it, when we are imbalanced is where things go awry. Okay, great. That really answered my question. So I'm just really curious from all the research you have done, pretty much tons of research so far. Um, what do you think is like the one thing about mindset that really alters a level of success that we experience in life or is something that people don't commonly know about as well? Well, I, yeah, I, I don't, I've heard people say that mindsets are the secret to success, which I, I agree with, but I'm not sure that's a secret because I think most people understand that mindsets are really important. Now, I don't necessarily think everybody values it as much as they should, but I think that the secret around mindsets is less about how important they are and more about what mindsets do we need to have. So when I talk to groups, I'll, I'll ask them, what mindsets do you know of that you need to have? And I usually get one of two answers. So one of the most common answers is they don't even answer. It's just kind of crickets in the room. The second answer is a positive mindset, which I don't disagree with, but it seems a little vague and fuzzy. So, so I think that one of the most important things for folks is to be able to put labels on mindsets because it's only when we have labels that we can introspect about them and do something about them. And so hopefully through this podcast, what we've done is we've helped people to create a language around mindsets that allows them or, or, or improves their capability of stepping outside of themselves to investigate the quality of their mindsets. And, and if we can get people to do that, then those people are going to be much more open to shifting their mindsets and unlocking greater success for themselves. Because if we could push forward our mindsets and see the world better, naturally, we're going to think better, we're going to learn better, we're going to behave better, and therefore, we're going to have better success. I definitely agree with you. And before I ask the last question, just want to ask uh, where you can the viewers learn more about you and connect with you. Yeah, thank you. Uh, the best place is my website. It's ryangotfordson.com. There you can find the, the mindset assessment, which is free. I uh, really encourage people to do that so you can wake into your mindsets. Also, you can get my book there if you're interested in ebook, uh, print version or audio book. And in fact, 
For example, if you buy the print version, you can get the audio version for free. Um, so there's some, and other promotional items as well associated with the book. So websites are the best place. Also, I'd be happy to connect with anybody on LinkedIn. That's probably the second best place. Okay, and the last question is, what is the legacy that you want to live in this world? Oh man, I, I feel like if I could leave a legacy that revolves around just helping others to become at their best. I feel like as I've been on my own mindset journey, a focus on mindsets has done more for making me my most ideal self than anything else I've ever focused on. And, and so if I feel like if I could help people awaken to their mindsets, then we can empower them to shift their mindsets. And I think ultimately what, what that will have is a really positive effect on the world. If we can get I mean, here in the United States, I don't know if you're seeing much in the news, is we're having protests across the United States um, because of police brutality um, to certain de demographic groups. And, and fundamentally, in any sense of brutality, it, by, by its very nature, is there has to be an inward mindset behind it. And, and when when riots occur, like we've had looting, people breaking into stores, stealing everything, um, that's also an inward mindset, right? So when, to try to, to try to heal our world, combating an inward mindset with an inward mindset is never going to work. What everybody needs to do is shift more to having an outward mindset, seeing others more as people and less as objects. So I think, Hopefully that's a good example about how focusing on mindsets can really improve our world and make it a better place. And so hopefully uh, I, I can make a dent in some small way. Definitely. I totally agree with the last part. Like it really is something I, I realized like, oh, wow, that's true. Those that um, do brutality, those that loot are more of like the inward. And then if we can transit to the outward, which is more of um, seeing people as humans, uh, loving them as humans as well and helping them out, then the world will definitely be a, at a much better place. So thanks for being on this podcast, Ryan. And for all those people who want to know more about mindset, he has a mindset assessment on his website, ryangotfresson.com. Go ahead and take the mindset because I've taken it and you can pretty much see where you land on the scale of these four different mindsets. So till the next episode, start living your legacy, guys. Awesome. Thanks for having me on, Darius. Really appreciate yeah. it. No problem. Oh.